customers have emotional needs. Very few of the customers that we service absolutely have to have a tie or a belt or a particular piece of luggage or a brand that's specific to the brands that they're purchasing. All of those things serve a bigger, somewhat functional, but often emotional need that they have. And the ability to understand that need and serve it in a way that is best for that particular consumer is the biggest lesson I learned early in my career. This is the E-Commerce Brain Trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high-level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. Hello and welcome back to the e-commerce brain trust podcast. I'm your host, Kiri Masters. And today we're airing a fascinating interview with David Katz, the CMO of Randa Accessories. This was a really interesting discussion with um, David Katz because we're talking about where brands sit in the consumer ecosystem today. And David has a unique perspective on this, having having a rich history in direct marketing. There's a, a funny story that he he recalls at the top of the interview about being essentially pushed onto the set of QVC and HSN to promote products and building his direct marketing chops from there. In this interview today, David and I talk a lot about brands, where they come from, where they're going in the Amazon era, and how uh, even though consumers, there seems to be a migration away from brands and a migration towards private labels and kind of non-brand brands that we talk about. But David really believes that brands are, are becoming, there's almost a pendulum effect in place, but brands are becoming more important, that they're more of a signal to customers about what kind of purchase decision they need to make and an identifier of quality values. So I think based on this discussion, if you are a brand owner, it is actually encouraging to think of this of things this way. And Randa as a company is still very much involved in the Amazon ecosystem. They're both a, a vendor and a seller on Amazon and have a really strong partnership with Amazon, even though Amazon is really pushing forward very strongly into private label brands in the accessory space. So I hope you enjoy this interview with David Katz from Randa Accessories. Okay, so today I'm talking with David Katz, Alchemist and Chief Marketing Officer at Randa Accessories, a leading multinational consumer products company and the world's largest men's accessories business. In his role at Randa, David collaborates with remarkable brands including Levi's, Polo Ralph Lauren, Dickies, Nautica, Tommy Hilfiger, Columbia Sportswear, Kenneth Cole, Timberland, Ryan Seacrest, and Tommy Bahama. He markets these brands through 18,000 points of sale and millions of page views, inclusive of Macy's, Coles, JCPenney, Amazon, Nordstrom, Walmart, Target, Hudson's Bay, Liverpool, Debenhams, David Jones, Printomp, and El Cortez Inglés. He's also the co-author of the best-selling book, Design for Response, Direct Creative Direct Marketing That Works, is a frequent public speaker and also cited in the press as a retail industry expert. Welcome to the show, David. Kiri, thank you for that terrific introduction, as long as it was. It, it, I don't know that it's as interesting or as impressive as it sounds, but thank you for that. And I am thrilled to be on the show today, and I look forward to our conversation. Well, where I wanted to start, because this was a very intriguing portion of your resume to me, is that um, you've actually made over 200 on-air appearances as a as a show host for QVC, HSN, and Shop NBC, so ah, so you decided <laughs> to, to start little... there. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And as many things in life, necessity becomes the mother of invention. It was never my intention to become an on-air guest host or personality. 
we were selling products to Home Shopping Network and to QVC, and we hired professional guest hosts who were on-air experts who knew how to do all of the special skills and talents that are required to be a terrific engagement personality on air. And one day down in Tampa, Florida, or Clearwater, which is where Home Shopping Network is located, there was a storm, and our guest host did not make it to the studio on time for our show. And I asked our producers, can we just delay our show a while? And and the answer in typical Hollywood fashion was the show must go on. And no, you have to do it on schedule, and you need to have a guest host to work with our own uh, on-air host. And I said, well, I'm sure there must be professional guest hosts around here. Why don't we go find one? And while I'm saying this, they're threading a microphone inside my shirt and shoving an inter-ear IFB into my ear. And some woman's coming over and putting makeup and lipstick on me. And, and I, I'm looking at them like, I don't know why you're doing this because I'm going to look for some guest host. And they went, we found one and you're on in 10, 9, Eight, and they kind of pushed me out onto the set. And I was certain I was going to be miserable. I was going to choke and freeze up. I hadn't done, you know, other than performing in front of my family in junior high school, I hadn't done anything to an audience. But I actually, I guess I'm a ham and I enjoyed the experience. I like talking about our products. And so that was the beginning. And I went on to do quite a few shows for Home Shopping Network and QVC and some other shopping networks. And I learned some incredibly valuable lessons about direct marketing through the experience. Mm. And so direct, this was at the, in the early stages of your direct marketing career. Is that right? That is correct. So the, this was fairly early in my, my marketing career, my professional career. I had done some direct marketing in print production where we worked with large credit card issuers like American Express. At the time, Diners Club and uh, oil company, petrol companies like Exxon and, and Mobil and airlines such as United Airlines and American. And we put direct marketing offers inside their credit card statements that they mailed monthly. And in fact, right. we offered that instead of having them print their envelopes, if they let us put an offer of merchandise on their envelope, we would give them the envelopes. And then later on, we gave them a commission. So that's how I started in direct marketing. And I kind of yep. find it fascinating. It was my messaging direct to consumers rather than through third parties. And so there was a purity of stimulus and response messaging. And by the time I did the TV products, it was fascinating to see the feedback loop that you engaged in with consumers. Because when you're doing home shopping, there are monitors facing you as you're speaking that show incoming call volume, the number of people who are signing onto a website, the number of orders being received, number of units that are available, the demographics and psychographics of the customers that are responding. And as you're speaking or demonstrating a feature or benefit, you can literally in real time watch a change in response. And what an education that was. I mean, it was really terrific. And that built on my print direct marketing background. And so that was fairly early in my career. And I learned to love marketing directly to consumers and understanding what mattered to them and, and what would stimulate a response. And so what kind of lessons and techniques have you taken from those days where you were really in the direct marketing world and seeing what the stimulus and response was to certain offers and things like that? As the CMO at Randa now dealing with enormous catalog of products and brands and retail channels. What do you take away to this day from from your early career in direct marketing? That's a, a great question, Kiri. Um, I would tell you, I think I bring a lot of the key learnings forward. Obviously, the technology, the, the data analysis, the way that we look at paths to purchase and quantitative and qualitative mm -hmm. data has become much more sophisticated and intricate. But the basic premise that customers are not just looking for facts and figures and, you know, spell out the details about a product or service and the price value and they will respond. Um, that was never true. It wasn't true in print. It wasn't true in home shopping. And it's not true today. Customers have emotional needs. Very few of the customers that we service absolutely have to have a tie or a belt or a wallet or a particular piece of luggage or a brand that's specific to the brands that they're purchasing. All of those things serve a bigger, somewhat functional, but often emotional 
need that they have. And the ability to understand that need and serve it in a way that is best for the, that particular consumer is the biggest lesson I learned early in my career. And that is as true, if not more true than ever before. And I come from, before I even started direct marketing, a neuroscience background. I had planned on being a doctor right. and I went, yeah. my undergraduate education is in neuroscience. And again, that was about stimulus response and behavior. People are not rational. They're rationalizing, which is a quote from Carl Jung. Everyone believes they respond because of truly logical reasons. But the truth is most people are responding to things because of deep-seated emotional reasons that they may not even understand themselves. And so that knowledge, the knowledge of, of serving a customer's needs as it evolves and changes is the most valuable lesson I carry forward. Fascinating. The psychology portion of marketing is so huge and, and can't be understated. So what you're doing at Randa today, just tell us a little bit about how you work with all these brands and, and retailers and the different value propositions and what that looks like for you. Sure. We'd be happy to. You know, brand management, brands themselves represent very much this emotional content that I was describing. Mm -hmm. They are a validation of a lifestyle and an image, a quality, a price point and value of how you feel about yourself and how you believe you are projected on others and how they perceive you. So brands represent that personal identification. If you look at the word brand, mm -hmm. it goes back to herds and being able to separate out some organisms or people from the herd by putting a literal brand onto livestock. Right, the owner. Right, so that's the, the origins of the word. And, and today it's how do you separate yourself from the herd? How are you different? What do you believe in? And, and different people at different times of their purchasing and life cycle and, and days want to identify with certain types of groups of people and identities. And that's what brands do for us, is they help you say this brand, Ralph Lauren or Levi's or Tommy Hilfiger or Williamson Dickey, has a DNA and an essence that represents a certain price value, a certain quality, a certain aesthetic, a certain lifestyle. When I wear it, I will feel like I belong to that mm -hmm. particular lifestyle, and other people will see me that way. And for Randa, which sells over 75 million units of product a year, we want to serve virtually all segments of customers in all channels of distribution in different lifestyles and different geographies. And mm -hmm. so what they want to wear if they are an assembly line worker who has to wear a belt, let's say, to work, that's one particular lifestyle, and Williams and Dickey may be the perfect belt and brand to associate with. If they're wearing mm -hmm. jeans to a rock and roll concert, they may be wearing Levi's. They probably are. It's the number one denim brand in the world. And they may want to identify with a Levi's belt. And there are different kinds. Where would they buy those products? And how would they buy them? And how do they shop for them? And how does it make them feel? So for Randa, brands have to become part of a portfolio of go-to-market strategies. We want brands for younger men. And for older men, for affluent customers, and for those who have less to spend on accessories, for people who have active physical lifestyles, we have Columbia Sportswear, for people who want to be trendy, for people who want to be seen in a particular position. Are you going to a wedding? Are you going to be seen on social media? And so we have a brand portfolio that covers the needs of those customers and their perceptions. But we mm -hmm. also see a change in the way that people look at brands because social media and influencer networks are providing a new type of validation. The, your peers now tell you what they think is good price value and what an identity and what they identify with. And so the way we market to these consumers and use brands is fundamentally changing. But the mm -hmm. concept of branding has not. It's still very important. And in terms of retailers, we're the number one supplier. Let's take belts as an example. We're the number one supplier of belts to Nordstrom and to Liberty of London and Separages, but we're also the number one supplier at Walmart and at mm -hmm. Costco. And at right. Macy's and at Kohl's, and you mentioned quite a few of these at Printemp and El Corte Inglés and Liverpool. But each of those retailers has a different group of consumers who prefer to shop there. 
and they need a somewhat different product and they have a different proposition as to why do they shop there? What are they looking for? So our goal is to optimize this portfolio of products, of classifications, of brands, of channels of distribution. And I don't know if that addressed your question. Yeah, it's good. There's a couple of points I wanted to dig into there a little bit. One is around what you see as the future of brands, and I'm guessing you're going to be pretty bullish on it, but I'd like to set up the scenario that some brands find themselves in, and that is competing with Amazon directly with their private labels and the emergence of sort of anti-brand brands like Brandless, whose whole value prop is you don't need a brand, you just need good product. And we have organic products that are shipped to you that all cost $3 or less. I mean, that right. is a brand. <laughs> Correct, which is interesting. Yeah, There's this kind of seemingly a revolution with, like you mentioned, the, con- the group of consumers who are more interested in following peers and social influences rather than being, you know, identifying as a uh, a loyal customer of X ABC brand. So interested to hear your perspective on that. Do you think that this recent movement towards, you know, unbranded products and private labels is just a different evolution of a brand experience or yeah, what's your perspective there? Wow. Well, first, I think you asked about six brand questions, all of which (laughs) are really good questions. And of course, you had to say the A word, which was Amazon.com. I always say the A word every episode. (laughs) Okay. So to address some of those brand topics, yes, you are correct. I am a big believer that brands continue to be important. I do think there is a evolution as to what brands mean to customers. And there are certainly fewer customers that are mono brand that believe their entire lifestyle is Ralph Lauren and everything they wear head to toe is going to be that. And they're going to shop in a particular way. I think that they are mixing brands. They are buying upscale and downscale. They're they're, they're buying something at Prada and they're accessorizing it with something from H&M or Zara. So there's a certainly there's a shift in the way customers experience this. And some of that is social media centric. They're, They're seeing a look on Instagram. And then they're getting validation from their peers who like that look and think it's appropriate for the lifestyle that they want to affiliate with. And it's more important to them to get that look than for it to be mono branded. So Mm -hmm. that's a shift. And that information is happening, is being spread and shared so fast amongst these new micro communities that pop up that are, you know, you may be part of a community where there are people in Southern California, in Vermont, in London, somewhere in Tokyo, and they're all part of one community of similar interests. That's that's wonderful and it's very difficult to market to, but it's it's certainly a change of how people perceive brands. I do think it's really interesting that brandless has become a brand yeah. and it does have a lifestyle and a connotation to it when you shop there. And I think there are customers who want simply the best features and benefits at the lowest cost so they get the best price value formula. And that's all they're looking for because that's what they identify with. They identify with practicality. Right. And there's always been that segment of customers and there will continue yep. to be. There are more ways for them to choose that. But I, just as there are customers that are doing that, it's a difficult way to shop because now you're a customer who follows that migration is reading the specifications in great detail to determine whether it's appropriate for what they want or not versus choosing a brand that has inherently in its DNA all the attributes that are important to you. So if you know it's that brand, you know it works for you. Yeah. So it's a lot of work to shop on something that is somewhat commoditized. The other thing that's a danger, I think, when you look at these non-branded pure price value products is in in many ways, it's a race to the bottom. And because a commodity really yes. has as its primary value proposition price. Yep. And the problem with the race to the bottom is you might just win. And what does it mm-hmm. mean as a vendor or a retailer to win the race to the bottom? That or worse, yeah, worse, what happens if you come in second? Yeah. You know, so I think that that's a dangerous slippery slope to end up on over time for the vendor community. There's certainly a compression in the value chain to give more value, faster delivery at a lower price, but that doesn't mean that you have to commoditize it. I think that there are segments of customers 
many segments of customers who want to identify with something that is appropriate for them, that's that's kind of targeted to their niche and their needs and wants, that's associated with a brand and maybe a retail channel. And I, I don't see that going away. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. I think something that anyone who's been shopping on Amazon recently for a cell phone case or some kind of accessory for their cell phone or other types of highly commoditized products find that the endless selection that Amazon has created from you know allowing creating such a huge marketplace business is that there are too, 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 too many options and they're all, you know, within a penny of each other and they all look exactly the same. So by virtue of creating kind of an unlimited brand library on Amazon, I think a brand <laughs> customers are essentially going to come back to brands because like you said, a brand is not necessarily a marker of quality, but of a marker that people can relate to on some level that are gonna it's gonna make purchasing decisions easier for them because they know where that brand fits in across whatever the attribute they're shopping for, like you said. Correct. Because there there are some customers who shop purely for value, but there are others who shop for convenience. With appropriate yep. pricing and convenience, Amazon's very good at convenience. I think it's a, I'm a prime, Amazon Prime customer, as is most of my family. And, and I would tell you that, that if you know what you want to buy and you surgically search for it, buying from Amazon is a terrific experience. But if yep. you're just looking for a smartphone case, as you, you mentioned, right? Just looking for that. It's the lack of curation mm -hmm. becomes an experience that's very frustrating and difficult to shop. Yep. So I think that brands and retailers who make curated choices for the consumer along the lines that customers would like to curate themselves are providing a value inherently to that consumer. And the consumer is going to be willing to pay a reasonable premium, whatever that might be, for getting that experience. Yep. Yeah, 100% agree. There's so many different new, well, nothing new is truly new, but business models that are based around curation now, not necessarily even brick and mortar, but the plethora of subscription boxes and stylist services for busy young professionals who don't want to choose out their own, choose their own clothing. <laughs> so cur curation has become a business model, uh, again as well, which I think sure. speaks to your point. And I think you're taking that personal shopping service that was provided one-on-one -on -one at specialty retail, and we've now migrated this to an omni-channel experience. Yeah, totally true. And so what is your sort of big picture blue sky outlook on the omni-channel environment and where you see Randa fitting into that in terms of all of your different channel partners as well as other brands? Well, first, I think Listen, omni-channel is very important. It provides a valuable experience and service to consumers. It's important to note that in the world of fashion, apparel, and accessories, which is what I trade in, most customers still make mono-channel purchases, meaning they start at mortar and brick and end at mortar and brick, or they start online and end at mortar and, and end online. 20 mm -hmm. some odd percent, 25 percent perhaps of customers shop both channels within a given product purchase funnel. And that's growing. And it is significant. And we're going to see more of that. The other thing is that omni-channel customers, customers who shop both within a purchase funnel, are spending more and tend to come away with a higher degree of satisfaction. So they're a very important growing segment. But we can't ignore the 75 plus percent of customers who prefer to purchase through a single channel. And the majority of apparel and fashion and accessories are still sold in mortar and brick physical mm -hmm. stores. Um, and some of that is trying product on and, and feeling it and, and some of it's getting your size right and, and some of it's the pleasure that some people receive from shopping in stores and yeah. shopping with other people. So I, I think it's important to put this in the context that not everything's going on the channel and not everything is going to direct to consumer e-commerce. Mm. With that said, there is this very interesting collaborative consilience between the effect of online shopping on in-store customers and the effect of in-store shopping on online customers. So, for instance, our consumer insights research and our data analytics has shown us that 80% of our customers plus are shopping in a physical store 
But most of those customers have a smartphone in their hand while they're shopping and they're checking prices and reviews online while they're inside a store. And Mm -hmm. so one of the takeaways for us on that particular path to purchase is how important it is to have great digital content on all of our products and brands that validate for the customer the purchase they're making while they're in a physical store. So there are times we put product on line, whether it's on Amazon or on Macy's.com or at Zappos or through Walmart or from other cha- or our own direct to consumer activities, where we put that product with remarkable photography, the appropriate videos, we put it up there with incredible copy that's not just search engine optimized, but actually tells the customers the information they need. We make sure that as many people experience the product and review it as accurately as possible. And in many cases, we maintain that at the highest possible price online to validate the purchase they're making when they're in a department store or another retailer. So that we are now spending lots of money creating wonderful digital content whose goal it is to help people buy it physically in a store. And conversely, we're learning the power of reviews and online Mm. reviews, and we're taking online reviews and the number of stars and the number of reviews and some of the best comments, and we're putting them on packaging in physical stores saying, hey, look at this rack of product. Everything here is a four-star review with over a thousand positive reviews. And on the hang tag, you can read comments from Sally and John who say, this is the best XYZ I've purchased. Oh, how interesting. That's great. It's kind of taking the showrooming, is reversing that showrooming experience and bringing all the online data and social proof back into the store. Really interesting. No, very much. And that's that's where I think, you know, you get these omni-channel messages. It's not the purity of buying online or buying in store. It's the integration and the merger of customers are very comfortable looking online while they're in a store. Or, as I said, in omni-channel shopping, if you look at the stats of how people buy, a lot of people will shop online, go into a store, try something on and see how it looks on them, and then go back home and buy it online. Yep. So, you know, you, I don't know that the, there are these clear lines. And as you mentioned, there's virtual shopping and augmented shopping and rental purchases and subscription and resale. Mm-hmm. It's all just part of one growing commerce continuum without fine lines that are saying stay within this border. Even geography is becoming borderless, right? I mean, we have a big office in Melbourne, Australia, and a lot of our employees and associates in Melbourne buy from American online retail sites Mm -hmm. and have it transshipped from a Miami mailbox to them in Melbourne. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. So all these borders, you know, physical, online, uh, geographic borders, they're all being broken down to one seamless commercial commerce experience, which benefits the consumer. But it can also be overwhelming. Yeah, definitely. Especially for a single channel merchant. Correct. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us today talking about direct marketing and how your experience with direct marketing has evolved as you're overseeing the marketing for such a huge company with different brands and different retail touch points. So thanks again for your time, David. Well, thank you, Kiri. It's a pleasure being on the show. I I look forward to listening to more of the segments. I learn a lot every time I I listen. And I hope your audience learns something of value. Thanks a lot. Thanks. And just before you go, David, where can people follow you, follow your work online? The easiest place to find me is probably LinkedIn. I'm David J. Katz, because there's a lot of David Katzes out there. I'm David J. Katz, and Randa Accessories is the company that I am chief marketing officer and, as you mentioned, alchemist at. And you can find out what that really means by looking at my content on LinkedIn. And I do quite a bit of public speaking. Tomorrow, I'll be at Columbia Business School at the annual retail forum. I speak at Women's Wear Daily conferences and at Shop Talk. So you probably can catch me internationally and domestically in some of my speaking engagements. Brilliant. We'll link up to those in the show notes for today's episode. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Catch you later.